Ilgė ir šiandien man labai malonu jūsų pristatyti Nancy Houston, rašytoja, muzikantė, šokėja. Ji gimė anglą kalbėje Kanadoje, Calgary mieste, Albertos provincijoje. 1963 metais būdama studentė pagal kolegio aplinių programą jie atvyko į Paryžių. Čia vadovavimo filosofo semiotiko Valano Varto parašė magistro darbą apie kalbos skabų ir atsitų stažių į problemą kalboje. 1981 metais jį išleido pirmąjį romaną prancūzų kalbą Kolbergo variacijos. Iki šiol net jūs mums parašė ir išleido 15 romanų prancūzų kalbą, dvi negrožinės prozos knygas, vieną apsakymų rinkinį, keturias pjesės, 18 esė rinkinių, du tomus laiškų, 13 iliustruotų leidinių, septynes knygas veikams ir paugliams, šešias nesavo knygų, šešis nesavo knygų vertimus, parašė įžangas šešioliai knygų, suimgė šešis literatūros koncertus, kurių metu atigrojo, išleido dvi kompaktinės poštulės, suveidino dviejose filmuose, išleido 11 savo romanų vertimų į anglų kalbą. Už savo kūrybą neatsi jūs kan aptuvantuota dešimčią literatūros premijų, tarp jų svarbiausių Kanados literatūros aptuvanojimų, Kanados generalinio gubernatoriaus premiją ir prestižinę Prancūzijos seminą premiją. Ji yra į Ježo ir Otavos universitetų garbės taktarė. Ponius ir ponai, jūsų dėmesiui Nancy Houston. It's a very good thing that I don't speak Lithuanian because I would probably be blushing. So I just gave hard facts about your work. Honestly, it was only numbers, so there's nothing to blush about, I guess. Anyway, so hello again and welcome to Vilnius. I'm over the moon to be able to be here and to share my love for your work with the my audience, with Venus audience, my own town. Um, so I would like to start the conversation by asking one thing that um, perplexed me a little bit when I looked at this uh, wonderful uh, translation of your uh, book, Dolce Agonia, into Lithuanian, and the uh, the back uh, of the book says, and I quote, Nancy Houston is one of the most famous Canadian writers, uh, winner of many literary prizes, 15 novels and 14 non-fictional books. Dolce Gonia is the 11th novel. Uh, is, is Nancy Houston's 11th uh, novel. Now, I've always known you as a French author. The book has been translated from French, so I was just wondering, what is your take on your on this denomination? Are you a Canadian writer? Are you a French writer? How do you feel yourself? Now I'm blushing. <laughs> um, I think really the only answer to that is the brilliant answer that Amin Malouf gave one time. You may know his work. He was born in Lebanon and he lives in France and writes in French. But he's from an Arab speaking background and so people tend to say to him, what are you deep down? Are you Lebanese or French? And he answers, I am my road. In French it's funnier because it's je suis means also I follow. So I am the road and I and that's who I am. And People who change countries are aware of the fact that they are their roads. People who stay in their own country can be unaware of the fact that they also are their road. If the road has stayed in one single country, then they call themselves Canadian or French or Lithuanian. If it has gone from one place to another, then they say, I'm a mix. 
I cannot say I'm a Canadian writer because I've never written one word in Canada. However, <laughs> I can't say I'm not a Canadian writer because I spent my entire childhood in Canada and that made me deeply down who I am. It created my brain, it created my habits of speaking and looking and interacting with the world. That's what childhood is about. So I can't just pretend that like Athena, I was born as an adult from the head of my father at the age of 20, you know. So I can't say that I'm a French writer either. And I don't hang out with French writers at all. Who do you hang out with? Swiss painters. <laughs> All right, one, one in particular, I suspect. No, I hang out with a lot of uh, people from the theater, from the world of dance, from the world of um, music. I do a lot of stage work, uh, more and more. And in fact, I always hear that I was the student of Roland Barthes, which is not false, but um, that was a choice that I made between the ages of 22 and 24. And uh, I'm 66. I've made a lot of choices since then. <laughs> and so I'm much prouder of decisions and choices that I made as, uh, after many years and, and that I'm happy with now. I, I'm not that proud of having been the student of Roland Barthes, to tell the truth. Mm. Well, it's hard to be proud and not proud to have been a student of, you know, mm. you know but um, to just pay homage for a moment to yeah. Vilnius and Lithuania, uh, I would say there is a person who you know, I'm going to say, is one of my favorite writers and thinkers of the history of the human race, who is Roman Gary, who was born here, grew up here. And they were exactly the same age Oh, my God, he was born in 1914 and Bart in 1915, and they both died in 1980 at the age of 65. Gary put a bullet in his head. I, I gather that Lithuania has the highest suicide rate in the world. Um, I don't know if he was trying to keep that uh, record up there, but um, Bart, as you know, died of... Uh, was hit by a car. It was a very childlike death. And it was a, it was my first, I would say, my first major mourning when, when Roland Barthes died. It was very important to me. But in many ways, they are opposed because Gary grew up in poverty and, and Barthes grew up in wealth, in, in the bourgeois milieu. Gary knew about strife, he knew about war, he knew about revolution, and he cared to incorporate those themes into his work. Um, also, he was the inventor of the ecological novel with the Roots yes. of Heaven yes. in 1956. Yes. And whereas Barthes, like all of the structuralists in France in those days, back when I was studying with them, didn't believe in nature. There was a real um, superiority of man to everything. And anything that wasn't language didn't exist in a way. And it was, it's a very Christian outlook if you come down to it, in, this, in the sense in the beginning was the word. But actually, in the beginning was not the word. And we're learning that now, that we're not. So in a way, Gary, you know, he, he praised elephants. And he thought that elephants had human rights. Did. 1956. Yes, Amazing. Yes, so, talking t about uh, Roman Gary, let's stay with him for a little bit. I just want to uh, draw the, your attention to the fact that you, Nancy Houston, have written a book dedicated to Roman Gary. It's called um, uh, Tomb of uh, Roman Gary. And in this book, you explain your affinity with this author. Uh, so would you like to tell us a little bit more about that affinity, what it consists of, and why? I mean, ecology is probably one of the reasons, but it I'm wasn't. Sure there is it more wasn't at the time, time. but it, it definitely is now. Yeah. Um, well, when in 1980, when they both died, I heard about Gary's death, and I knew about the fact that he had written under a pseudonym, and that there was a whole complication around that. But, and I had read 
La Vie Devant Soi, which was the book, the second Goncourt, because under a pseudonym he won the Goncourt for a second time, which is not allowed. Um, but 13 years later, I was teaching a class at Columbia on contemporary literature in France and social problems. And I wanted to talk about the uh, conflicts and tensions with the North African population in, uh, in France uh, and the way they're treated in racist manner and so on. So um, I reread La Vie de Bonsoir, life, The Life Before Us. And I just thought it was one of the best novels of French post-war literature. I was, uh, I was blown away by how funny it was and how profound it was and how, how free he was to deal with some of these taboo subjects. Because he was Jewish, he dared to make fun of Jews in a, in a way that no non-Jew would have dared to do, for example. And so I decided to teach this book, and uh, my students loved it, and they started writing papers about Roman Gary. And they said, because American students are often very naive, so they, they wrote these papers. Roman Gary was a, a little Arab boy who grew up in Belleville, in, in, a, in a, neighbor of, a neighbor of Paris. Neighborhood of Paris. And I, I, of course, knew that that was false, but then I didn't really know what exactly was true. So I started uh, doing some in-detail research to be able to say, no, he wasn't a, an Arab growing up in Belleville. But he was what? And the more I read, the less I knew. And the more I read, the dizzier I got. Because he lied so much, because he gave so many different versions and stories and in inventions of who he was and where he came from and who his parents were. Until his death, he claimed that he didn't know who his father was, whereas there's a very good birth certificate sitting right here in this city saying that he's the son of a furrier in the Jewish neighborhood over there. But he didn't want to have his father. And so I started getting more and more fascinated. And then when I saw that he lived in the United States, he lived in London, he, he'd been in Bulgaria. His first diplomatic post was in Bulgaria. I was married to a Bulgarian. He spoke all these languages. He translated himself backwards and forwards. And all of these identities, even Roman Gary was a pseudonym. His real name was Roman, which means novel, Katsif. And so I decided uh, he was a brother. And I, I loved him from then on because I loved his complexity and I loved the way he could use it uh, to be generous towards others rather than uh, tapping on his chest to say, I'm proud of who I am. It made him capable of understanding people from all different walks of life. And so I decided to read everything. I read his 32 novels, twice as many as I have written. <laughs> well, we still have time. But he was dead when he was my age. I know, but he was also my <laughs> We're not in a race. But um, I read all his novels, and, and then I, I just had to pay him homage. So I, I decided to write this tombo, and the tombo does mean tomb, but it's also a musical form uh, that Rameau used, uh, the Baroque composers used, it's a sort of uh, reiterated uh, melody. So I wanted to have a sort of rhythmic homage to, to Gary, and I say tu, I use the for informal address because he's like a brother to me, although I never met him, and I don't think I really would have liked him because he was a uh, macho, and I don't like, I don't get along usually with machos, but <laughs> apart from that. Now, uh, one other thing that possibly um, relates you, that uh, makes a comparison between you and uh, Roman Gary possible, is that you have both famously written uh, books in different languages, in English and French in both cases, to huge critical and uh, popular acclaim. Now, that is something that very, 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 very few people uh, choose to do, or those who choose manage to do really well. So I just wanted to ask you um, about your literary bilingualism. 
And before I do that, let me just um, quote something. I will quote you. So in 1986, <coughs> in a letter to Léla Sebar, you wrote, and I quote, Les livres, les enfants, je ne peux les faire que dans une langue non maternelle. Books, children, I can only do them in a language that is not my mother's. In 1989, you wrote the first paragraph of your first novel in English, Plain Song. And the novel was published in 1993 and was awarded the General Government Prize. And For the French version. For oh, the right. translation, okay. which set off a huge controversy. Okay, well, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, you know, you said, books, children, I can only do them in the language that is not my mother's, and yet, several years later, not that many years later, you do write in English, and then, and I told you again, you say, it was the beginning of a true writing life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? <coughs> Good for you. <laughs> you put your finger right on the wound. <laughs> Actually, this book with Leila Sebar, who is a woman born in Algeria, of an Algerian father and a French mother, and I met her in the women's movement at the end of the 70s, uh, and she suggested we write this book about our relationship to France and the French language. So it was called the Lettre Parisienne, which is a sort of play on Lettre Persane. Um, so can I just say it means... The Persian letters, so this is the Parisian letters, and we were writing from Paris to Paris. We weren't, I wasn't in Canada, she wasn't in Algeria. We were both living in Paris, working in Paris, writing in French. She had come to France uh, at 16 and so on. So we had a very different relationship to France and French, but we weren't Indigène, you know? Indigenous, that is. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'll try to remember to speak English. And, um, and what happened, I swear, I think I, that this book caused me to fall ill. I was telling one of the journalists about it this afternoon. I, well, the book was at press. It was just about to come out. And we had a, an event scheduled in a bookstore and everything. I had to cancel the event because I was having a spinal tap at that moment for a neurological illness that was paralyzing my legs. And I had a, an infection of the spinal fluid. And nobody ever understood what it was. But for about several months, I couldn't walk. So I couldn't go to this event and I couldn't promote uh, Lettre Parisienne, Parisian Letters. And so it's no, I think it's no accident. And Susan Sontag said, well, people have a tendency to see malady as metaphor, illness as metaphor. She wrote a book by that title, and she was against it. But I definitely saw my illness as a metaphor for the fact that I was freezing my roots. And it wasn't painful, so I had a lot of time to think and, and think about what was going on, what I was doing with my life. What I was doing with my life at that time was teaching feminist theory and structuralist theory and trying to write a little bit of literature in between, in French, using only my left brain, therefore, because, of course, I learned French as an adult or, you know, an old teenager. And eventually, I really felt that I was uh, being told to unfreeze, to defreeze my childhood. And I'm very grateful to my body for having given me that illness at that particular point in time. And what it made me do was say, OK, if you're going to be a serious novelist, if you really want to go all the way into writing novels, you can't pretend that you were born at 20 as a Paris intellectual. You can't. You have to go back to the pain and fright and anguish of what it was to be a little girl growing up in a very dysfunctional family in Western Canada that eventually ex the family, not Canada, exploded. <laughs> Canada might explode someday too. We might talk about it. So, um, that's, I think that after that 
period, I've been in, in Paris for 13 years already. I had um, built up enough strength from a human point of view and a literary point of view to have the courage to go back and speak English again in my writing. And that's why I went to Western Canada in my brain. I went to Western Canada in the bookstores of New York, Paris, and Montreal, but I did not go to Western Canada until the book came out. So you started reading in English, is that right? You started reading in English again, which you had given up doing, is that it? So that was the, the sort of the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then I really decided to write this book in English, which was a huge revolution. Okay, yeah. because the thing is, um, you say in, um, I can't, uh, maybe it was Annika, uh, you know, uh, a collection of your own fiction, you say that 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 first paragraph of your book came to you in your, uh, almost in, in sleep, in your sleep, that you were having, your second child had just been born and you had gotten up to attend to the baby and then you went back to sleep and this is where that first par paragraph came to you. So it, the way I had read it, and corrected me if I, I was wrong, I, it, it felt as if it wasn't all that terribly conscious, it, it, it was just something that happened. So uh, did you live it as, as a very conscious decision to now start writing in English? Well, what the image that you're mentioning indicates is that it wasn't a conscious action. Indeed, it was that my unconscious was being allowed to express itself, maybe for the first time in a number of years. And that I was, that was going to be okay. I don't think it was, I think you know my life better than I do, but I... Well, I've read, I've read your stuff. I mean, that's all I can do. You read it more recently. You read it more recently than I did, but I think that... <laughs> I think that it was the passage about the rodeo. And yes, right. it was. That was the first page in yes. my mind. It wasn't the first page in, in the published book, indeed. So, if there was one thing that, as a Paris intellectual, one could be ashamed of, it's, from, it's coming from cowboys and Indians country, you know? It was very... Um, Cal Calgarians, Albertans, were considered to be... Uh, you know, they're, they're just country bumpkins kind of thing, not sophisticated, not city dwellers and stuff like that. Cowboy lore is ridiculous. Cowboy lore is kitsch and, and ridiculous. So for me to, to have a, a passage about a rodeo and a wild horse, a wild mustang, and somebody who's uh, trying to ride the mustang, and what does that mean? What about the energies, the, the male energies that are going into that, both the, the human male and the, and the horse male energies that are fighting with each other, as in, as in uh, bullfighting as well. And the funny thing for me, I really have to say, that what gave me access to this, uh, to say, okay, actually that's interesting as well. Even Alberta can be interesting now, see. Who gave me access to that was a man from Haiti. Because I suddenly realized that I was interested in everybody's culture except my own, you know? And one day I happened to be with this friend from who was a Haitian poet that I met in, in Normandy. And we were watching something on TV and there was this sort of square dance, like what we used to do in the barns in my childhood. And I said, oh God, you know. And he said, no, look, they're having fun. They're, they're expressing things with their bodies and so on. And I suddenly realized, how oh, come on, I respect everybody's culture except my own, you know. So I'm going to try and see my culture, too, as part of the same movement of history. I could see his. I could see how there had been the discovery of America, that like Christopher Columbus was right where he was born, you know, that was that island, Hispaniola, is now Dominican Republic and Haiti, as that where it started. And it finished in Calgary, not in Vancouver, because they settled the West Coast first, and then they came back. And so this whole movement of colonization, go west, go west, go west, young man, and it went way out west to Cal California, to the West Coast of Canada, and then it came back across the Rocky Mountains, and it was finished 400 years later 
in my country, in my province. So I, then I could say that's part of a history that I find interesting, fascinating. And the people who settled Canada, I can now see them as being part of a history that came over from Ireland because of the potato famine. They had this religion, they met Indians, so-called Indians that had that religion. They put, they put them down. We didn't kill them the way the Americans did. We didn't murder them outright. <laughs> But, but we Still we have a very soft area of getting rid of people in Canada. <laughs> but we get rid of them. And um, and so suddenly, uh, because it became political in a way, it also became dignified uh, and able to reach literary status. Yes. So anyway, so the, the fact that you're still writing two lines, I'm fascinated. And, um, so I've been doing some uh, research, and it's really it's funny. So when you look at your French Wikipedia page, you have all the novels uh, and all the work that you have written in French. And then if you go to a English Wikipedia page, it's a totally different story with all, you know, the, all the English titles and the different years. And, and sometimes it will say, oh, self-translation, self-translation. Anyway, like the two things are separate. Like they have two different lines of their own. So I'm just wondering, how do you work like on everyday basis? So now you're writing, I know that you're writing in your book. How does it work? What language do you write in? How, how do you self-translate? Do you write one novel in one language? And how do you choose which language do you write it in to start with? And how does it all work? Actually, it's not that complicated because um, <coughs> starting with Plainsong, which was my first novel really set in an English-speaking background uh, context, um, I just wrote the language that my characters Book. And then I translated in the other direction. However, since nothing is simple in my brain, indeed, um, there are, there's a book called Instruments of Darkness, which takes place partly in New York today and partly in Le Berry, a, a region in central France, uh, in the late eight, 17th century. And um, so I wrote those alternating chapters in French and English and translated them vice and versa. And, <laughs> and I've always wished that there would be a Canadian publisher courageous enough to publish the original version of this because there are lots of people in Canada who speak both languages and could have fun, as I have fun, really, moving from one language to the other. But now I think I, I really know I learned a lesson with a book called Black Dance, which is a complete flop, in which I tried, I think just a few years ago, it's, it's one of the books that really nobody, nobody caught on to. I've never caught on because I was trying to make a theme out of bilingualism and show that people, there, there are huge numbers of people, there are millions and millions of people in the world who have at least two languages in their brains, and it's very, moving phenomenon. It's not a rare, unusual phenomenon, it's a common phenomenon. And in Quebec, uh, it so happens, I know someone who was in a family where the boys spoke English and the girls, it was a big family, the girls spoke French. Because <laughs> the boys were going to be expected to be breadwinners in an English-speaking powerful world, and so they, they had to speak English. So, and the girls had to keep the house fires burning and keep the language alive and so on. So the whole city conversations, I wrote these conversations in the book. But then I, I must say a sort of mea culpa now for black dance is that I now really apologize to my <laughs> readers because I realize that you, readers do not want to be taught things when they're in a novel. They want to live. There are lots of situations in, in the world for being taught things. This is one. Right now we can talk about bilingualism in a sort of abstract way and learn something. If you learn something in a novel, it has to be sort of unconsciously. You can't feel that the author is purposely sitting there trying to teach you something about bilingualism. You won't believe in the characters if he does that or she does that. So. I even had footnotes at the bottom of the page. I was thinking, we do it in the movies all the time. We go to a, a film, and there are subtitles. If we don't understand, we look at the subtitles. If we understand, we don't need to look at them. So I did these dialogues where the English in French and the French in English had subtitles. Nobody liked it. <laughs> so it didn't work. 
Well, I think it's probably um, a, prob a moral problem of a, of a publisher, really. It's, it's, you know, it's a marketing problem more than anything else because, well, yes, uh, bilingual literature does exist and some of us uh, do study it. So, and there is an article actually recently that came out on that book, an academic article. So anyway, we can um, talk about it uh, later. But, um, so when you talk about self-translation, you talk about the separate little bits that you translate well, how, no, no. So what I do usually, and what I'm doing now, for example, I'm writing a book in English. Um, I will have, I want to have the whole manuscript, and once the whole manuscript is there, and I think it's good, fairly good, fairly solid. Now maybe a couple of people have read it and said, "Yeah, you've got it." Then I translate it, and the translation then helps me to revise it, because. No matter how many times you reread something that you've written, uh, you can you always leave little little faults. There are repetitions. There's a bad rhythm. There's a phonetic clash of some sort. And I read things out loud many times, um, but if I have to translate them, those all of the faults come to the surface immediately, and so it helps me to correct. And so I go back and forth for months between the two versions until they're as similar as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you send one to the French publisher and the other one to the English publisher, is that it? Well, my agent does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and the English publishers haven't been taking my books recently. No, 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 no. Several books behind. And my Canadian publisher went out of business, so... It's not my fault, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it is. Anyway, interesting. Well, look, uh, why don't we talk about um, the Lithuanian version of one of your books, <laughs> uh, which is uh, Dolce Vanya, of course. And um, the book is set in uh, New England. It's, um, it, deals, it tells the story of, it's an Irish writer, called Sean Farrell, who is hosting a Thanksgiving dinner party at his place, and he invites his friends, neighbors, and ex-lovers in order to tell them that he has cancer, which he never does, but anyway. And then the book is told, is narrated uh, by the omniscient narrator God, uh, who intercepts his narrative with the death stories of each um, all the characters. Is that a fair summary? It's a good summary. <laughs> right. It's lots of fun. It is. It is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Highly recommended. Um, so I was just going to ask you what, about the inspiration behind this book, or of what this book, and about its idea, the idea that mm -hmm. um, It first came to me, I was with a an Italian sculptor friend of mine, Pucci de Rossi, who died in the meantime, and he came up with this title. And um, he said that someday he'd like to do a series of short stories collected under that title. And, and I thought it was such a great title compared to, I mean, in uh, echo to Dolce Vita, of course. So I, when I decided I really had to steal it, I asked his permission and he said, okay. As long as he could still use it later, I said sure. So I started writing it in uh, right after Brain Song uh, in ninety. Actually, Brain Song was not accepted for two years after I finished it because I didn't have any contacts in the English-speaking publishing world, and my French publisher was annoyed that I had taken an agent, and so they refused it. Le Seuil refused it, and they had done five of my books up until then, and I was sort of at a crisis at age 40. I'd already published 10 books, and I thought I was doing all right, and suddenly nobody wanted this plain song, which I thought was my best book to date, and it was certainly the, an important step, as you have gathered. So while it was suffering in silence in a drawer somewhere, um, I decided to start Dolce Agonia. I guess I was a bit depressed. and. Um, and I wrote for, I wrote about 300 pages. I was 41 or something like that. No, I was only 38. And it was very important, it's very important. The thing is, I, I wanted to write about this group of middle-aged people, and I realized after writing about 300 pages that I wasn't old enough yet. I didn't know enough about life yet. 
I hadn't had, an, I hadn't watched my kids grow up and leave and things like that. So um, I, I actually took those 300 pages and threw them in the fireplace and burned them and threw them in my computer garbage can and emptied it. And then I remembered there were some good pages in there. <laughs> so I called a technician. <laughs> And he came and helped me fish out some stuff. And, and by the end, the only thing that seemed valid and interesting to me from those, whatever I could save from those garbage cans, was the story of the dancer who had left her children. Um, and she had been involved in a friendship with this Irish poet called Sean Farrell. And so that became a novel called Slow Emergencies, which is La Virevolte in French. And that came out the year after Plain Song. And then there's this Quebec guy who told me Jean Ferrell is my favorite secondary character in the history of literature. And I said, wow, that's great. I should maybe revive him. So when I got to be 45 or so, I thought maybe I'm getting old enough to write Dolce Agonia. And so I brought those characters back into the book and I surrounded them with other people and then of course the question became how do you narrate this and I was sufficiently versed in French literary theory to know that one is not supposed to be an omniscient narrator that's gone out since the war and you're supposed to be have all these techniques to show that you're not pretending to be God and so on so I think I said, what the hell, I'll just be God, you know. <laughs> He's the only one who can know what's going on in all these people's heads and bodies and memories and so on. So I decided to put this God character there as the narrator. And it was interesting working with him because it turns out he's not very nice, actually. <laughs> because I could tell that he was jealous of human beings because he hadn't actually planned on the fact that if you make... Uh, intelligent creatures imperfect, which he did, um, they're going to love each other. They're going to need each other. And actually God, I mean, if he knows everything and he can do everything, he's all powerful, Who? why would he need love, right? So I don't, he's not a loving God. What he's really in charge of is, is death. And so he tells us how each of the characters is going to die. And it's like sitting and, and looking at a photograph from the beginning of the 20th century or something. You know, people are, you know, you've seen these photos of people, and Picasso and his gang or whatever, the, the painters, the musicians, or the writers, and now everybody's dead. But you can say, you know, this one died that way, this one died that way, this is how it happened. And, it's, and then you they're still smiling, you see. That's the wonderful thing about writing. So I can write, read you a little Please, passage. Yes. And in, uh, in America, uh, they, they thought that Dolce Agonia would be too complicated for people to understand, so they called it Sweet Agony. No, <laughs> <laughs> she. <laughs> They often do that. They always simplify the thing. I didn't even get to help no. my title. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Rachel. What will become of Rachel? Well, as a general rule, normal people tend to get depressed as they age, and depressed people tend to get more depressed. Rachel is no exception to the rule. In grief, in mourning since birth, for her zykloned uncles and aunts, for all the Jews of Europe, and for the children she'd been unable to conceive, and then for Sean Farrell, whom she'd loved more than anyone in the world, and then for Derek, whom she not only loved but married. Rachel will, against her will, live to be extremely old. And the amazing thing is that she'll go on being an exceptional philosophy professor to the bitter end firing her students with her enthusiasm, awakening their thirst for understanding, then slaking it somewhat, then making them realize how parched they still are. No plastic bottles. <coughs> Bringing to green and vibrant life, not only the dialogues of Plato, many of which she knows virtually by heart, 
than even the more arid thoughtscapes of Kant, Hegel, Leibniz. Her students worship her. They hold her in their heart. They thank her. They dedicate their books and theses to her. They hold her in their hearts as a model of kindness and lucidity. 65 comes and goes, and no one even dreams of suggesting she retire. She's not merely a pillar of the department, she's virtually a national monument. Her mind stays sharp and her tongue limber. Her gallows humor survives the decades unimpaired. At 83, she is still lecturing, and her lecture halls are still packed. There's another reason for which, despite her longing to do so, Rachel renounces rushing headlong into the ever-waiting, ever-welcoming arms of death. A double reason, Angela and Marina, Lynn and Derek's daughters. She feels that with their father dead and their mother as good as dead, out of touch these 20, 30, 40 years, the girls have been orphaned enough as it is. They need her. Marina especially needs her. This, reflects Rachel, is one of the pleasant surprises in life. People actually do love and need one another. At 60, Marina is more passionately attached than ever to her eloquent, illusionless, <coughs> octogenarian stepmother. They meet in Manhattan once or twice a month for a drink, a meal, a film, a play, a ballet, an art exhibit. The day I come to pluck Rachel, however, she is at home. Quite alone in the big old house purchased by Lynn and Derek back in the 70s, shortly after they were married. Rachel has seen the house undergo numerous transformations. Lynn danced in its attic for years. Angela and Marina grew up there. Lynn departed, Rachel moved in, then Angela left, and then Marina. Then Derek died, and a memorial service was held for him in the big old house. Now, Rachel has been living there by herself for ages, and now she is about to die there. She's run herself a bath. Carefully, she hoists, hoists her thin, knobby, aged body over the edge of the tub. Recalls for some reason the bath Lynn gave her many years ago following her single serious attempt to end her life. She just realized that trying to fit her neuroses around Sean's might not be the shortest path to happiness. Ah, how soothing the warm water had felt that day as the hands of her dearest friend sponged it over her skin, eat caked with vomit and excrement. And now, all these years later, destabilized, perhaps, by this ancient memory that flashed into her mind unbidden, she slips, bangs her head on the cold water tap, faints from the pain, sinks beneath the soapy, scented surface of the water. That's the end of Rachel's soul. The adventures of her body are not quite over, however. She's got a kindly next-door neighbor named Sarah, who, though considerably younger than Rachel herself, only mid-70s or thereabouts, is sliding swiftly down Alzheimer's slope. That evening, Sarah comes over with a letter from Rachel that was mistakenly delivered to her address. Knocks on the door, no answer. Sees the lights are on, knocks harder, calls out, no answer. Tries the door, finds it open. Rachel? Rachel? Checks out the different rooms. Rachel? Finally opens the bathroom door, sees the corpse in the bathtub, gasps in horror, rushes home, forgets what happened by the time she gets there. Hey, says her husband, why didn't she give Rochelle her letter? Oh yeah, says Sarah, blushing, flustered, aware and ashamed of the tricks her memory is now playing on her. She turns around, goes back to Rachel's house, finds the front door open, walks in, sees the dead body in the bathtub, shrieks in horror, rushes home, still with the letter in her hand. Don't tell me you forgot to deliver it again, says her husband with a tolerant smile, and so on, back and forth, half a dozen times. Sean and Rachel would probably have split their sides laughing had they been around to watch. If you allow me, I will leave this abstract in that you mean Lithuanian translation has been done from French by the wonderful uh, Aquila Novoneta, and 
characters. Vachala, Rachela. Kas nu tiks Rachelai? Tagi, esminga, kad normalų žmonės sangami žinana šiokia tokia depresija. O tie, kurie ne jau išgyvavo, dar labiau nepasuoja. Rachelai nebus išimtis iš šios teisyklės. Jie nuodėmi mokėti. Iš pradžių turėjo praudoti ciklono, tu jiems nužudytus dėdės ir tatas, o mokos žitus, vaikus, kurių negalėjo susilaukti, paskui šono ferolą, žmogų, kurį mylėjo labiausiai pasaulyje, tada derika, kurį ne tik mylėjo, bet ir išteikėjo už jo. Nemasim gelo ir tiesą sakant nenorumis, reičiai nagyvens iš ties labai ilgą gyvenimą. Tai nuostabiausia, kad iki pat savo gyvenimo pabaigos jau bus išskirtinė filosofijos dėstytoja. Gebinti kurstyti studentų entuziasmą, pažadinti jiems soškulį suprasti, paskui šiek tiek jau mašinti, kad jie geriau pajūstų, kokie liko iš troškę. Jis sugeba priversti, gyvoti ir tarpti ne tik Platono dialogus, kurių nemažai moka grintinai, bet ir iš pirmo žvėrsnio atšiūrėsnių skanto, lėkerio, lėgnių su minties peizažus, Studentai ją garbina, dėkoja jai, dedikoja vynyklas ir taktorio disertacijas. Jį jiems gerumo ir iškaus proto pavyzdys. Kai priėtėja 65-as iš jos imtadienis, niekas nei nepekinai ištarti žodžio pensiją. Jį yra daug daugiau negu katitros skirtinis atmo. Jį – nacionalinis monumentas. Jos protas tai yra buvus, lėžų išmaikštus, dešimt mečiai neikėk nečiip nuo jos juodojo humoro jausmo. Būdama aš norės dešimt trijų, jį dar skaito pagrindinės paskaitas o amfiteatrinės auditorijos teberas ausakimšus. Ir ar kita priežastis, dėl kurios nepaisydama kairių ketinimų, reikšėlė nepuolai visada atvirų ir įsitėtinga mirties lėgė. Priežastis dvi, Tairinos ir Tereko tuktaviais, Andželo ir Marina. Pagalios greikną šlaitės, jų tėvas mėrė su motiną nirodo jokių žankų 23-24 metų. Tai šiandien mano, kad merginant sypač mokinėje Marinai, jos reikia. Tai viena iš tų lietų malonių staigmenų, kurias mums pavošės gyvenimas kalvoja jį, nes juk žmonės iš tikrųjų prisirišo vienį prie kitų. Šią 75-ą Marina aistrinkai myli 80-mečią iliuzijas praradusią išklaipingą pamatą. Maždaug kas visą vaitės moteris susitinka Manhattan'ai išgerti turas, draugia kunai įteikinę baletą restorantų muziejų. O tai vieną kaitinių pasiimti reičiarės randų ją visiškai vieną didelėme senamę name, kurį aštuntajame dešimtmetėje netrukus pavėdybų nusipirkolina ir terekas. Per tą laiką reičiarė pažįsta namą, jame įvyko labai daug pokyčių. Ilgai Lina šoko jo palėtėje, o Andželo ir Marina joje žengė pirmos iš žingsnius. Lina išėjo iš atsikrausio reikčiai, Andželo išskrido, vėliau ir Marina, tada mėrė Derikas, jo laidų dvi atveikos vyko didelėme senamė nata. Ilgus metus reikčiai gyveno jame viena, iš tai šiandien ji jame mirs. Ji prisveržia mane vandens, apnuodina seną, jėsą, kaulėtą savo būną, ir atsargiai liko į vonę įsitvėrusi jos kraštą. Stavėjo jūs atmintėje atėjo tą tolimą dieną, kai po vienintelio tikro neįdėjimo baigti savo gyvenimą, jį nesenį suvokė, kad derinti savo neurozijos prie šono neurozų tikriausiai nėra pats kesiausias kelias į laimę, Lina maudė ją mūnioje. Kaip ją į talią buvo gerą, pašiltą vandens, prangiausios draugės pilomo ją į ant odos, apskratusios vienalais ir išmatomis. Ir padokybės metų dabar, sutrukdyta galbūt šio seno, ne tiek jis negeisi atgyjusio prisiminimo, jį praranda pusiausvarą, krinta, susitrenkia galvai iš automonės šiaupą, apalpsta iš skausmo, nusleista buvo vandienio, po kurio paviršiuje, kurio paviršiuje atsiguliuoja na vagnus burbulai. Tokia reikia jis gyvenimo pabaiga. Tačiau jūs Kauno motikiai dar ne visai baigėsi, nes jį turi kaimynę, labai malonė moterį, vartų sara, sara daug jaunesnių žaičiai, tarp tik 70, tačiau visų greičių čiuožia Alzheimerio škaitų žemėjimą. Ta vakarą savo atnešo žaičiai laišką, kuris per kaitą buvo pristatytas jai. Jį paveidžia turis, niekas neatsilėpė, jį mato, kad dar išviesa ir paveidžia garsiau, pašaukia, tačiau niekas neatsilėpė. Jį mėlyna atidaryti turis, jos atsidavo. Reičiolė, reičiolė, šaukia vaišio vieno po kambarius. Reičiolė, galų galėjai jėgai mojos kambarį, pamato lavonimo nėje, persigantusi su rinka. 
Pola namoja pamiršta, kad kas atsitiko prieš lyštą. Kodėl netida vyrykčia vai laiško pausijos vyras? Netida dėl murmurus namo išgėdo sara. Nežino, kad amintis pradeda kreisti jai šumybės. Todėl susisgrimba. Grįžtai kainijas namus. Rada plačiai labotas duris. Įeina į vojos kambarį. Pamato lovoną, persikantusi su rinkai, pamirsto pardėdą namo rankoje, tai palaikydama laišką. Tai nesakykite, dėl to aš šiaip paduoti laišką. Ar leidžiai šis odamas, jis sako, jei geras. Ir taip toliau, ir taip toliau. Kokius penkis ar šešis kartus, pirmi matau. Ir šonas ir eičiame būtų galėjo, jei šonas ir eičiame būtų galėjo matyti tą sceną, tikriausiai būtų jei ir jokais. Thank you. Thank you very much to the translator as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you very much for the translators who are uh, working for us uh, today. Uh, I will just take one minute to say uh, that the audience will be able to ask questions as well. So before um, the questions come along, we, um, I would like to briefly touch upon your um, latest, the very, very latest uh, work. Um, so that is your um, 2016 novel called The Club of Relative uh, Miracles that is um, not yet translated into English, is that right? I wrote it in English, but it's not yet published in English, yeah. Oh, right, okay. So it's published in French, but not yet published. So you wrote it in English, okay. Very interesting. Anyway, so your leading scholar of your work at this time in time, Kate Avery says, and I quote, uh, this novel focuses on the recent expansion of the tar sands mining industry in Canada and presents a searing condemnation of its social and, uh, and environmental impact. Would you think it's fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you tell us more about your literary engagement with the environmental issues? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I think um, it's interesting that that book wasn't published, and I'm not sure. I, I can, well, as I was saying earlier, I can understand the problem with black dams because of the bilingualism, if you open a book like that, it looks complicated. You're just going to sort of instinctively put it back on the table in the bookstore. But this one, um, I wonder if there wasn't some political issue, maybe. Mm. Um, because everybody depends on oil in Canada. Probably the publishing houses also depend on oil to some extent, just as the art galleries do, just as, uh, you know, pretty much everyone. It's a, it's a huge, uh, it's kind of its biggest industry. Um, so it just happens to be where I come from. And I was very shocked when I started reading articles about the way things were being done there. And so I had to go and see it for myself. And then it is, a, again, an issue what you do when you have something to say, you know, kind of thing. You really want to put across a message. And the, when I was on the spot still and very upset by everything that I had seen because we'd had real visits, a tourist visit of the Suncor uh, installation. There are 300 oil companies from all over the world that are in this section of northern Alberta, hundreds of miles away from the nearest large city. They have done a lot of deforestation, of course. They've uh, moved a lot of native uh, Canadians, indigenous peoples, and uh, but also since they're filthy rich, they build them new villages over here and build the cultural centers for them and creches and things like that. <laughs> there you go, be like us, you know. Um, and there are ten thousand, not one hundred thousand workers from all over the world, but especially from countries from South Africa, South America, and um, from the Philippines, and so on, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm, when you talk about a city with 100,000 men living in it, uh, you're talking about prostitution, like the gold rush. And so when you're talking about prostitution in Western Canada, you're talking about Native women that are going to get 
murdered, more than a thousand murdered since 2003, or disappeared, anyway. And it's rough, it's a rough, rough, rough scene out there. And that's just the people who are working there, but then or they, if you want to get that tar out of the sand, you see the tar sounds, you want to get the tar out of the sand to be able to export it and send it down to Texas to get refined, or go to China to get refined through the pipelines that Trump just said yes to after Obama had said no to. Um, well, you have to use fracturing. Uh, and if you use fracturing, hydraulic, uh, right? Uh, you call it that. You're going to blast the tar with uh, with water at high temperatures and high speeds, and so that's going to get the tar out. And then you've got all of this runoff that is going to go into these holding ponds, which are therefore full of poison. And then you're going to have the the greeners, the ecology people on your backs, because their birds are going to die from alighting on those holding ponds by the thousands. So you want to keep the birds off the holding ponds. So what you do is you, you're going to put these uh, recordings of cannonballs or classical music very loud to keep the birds away from the surface of the water. So we, you have this, these cannonballs going off 24 hours a day to keep the birds away from the water. Human beings are crazy, you know what I mean? Yeah? And of course, you can keep the birds away for a while. There are several dozens of species that have been become extinct since this started happening. But what you can't do is build a bottom to your holding pond. You can build the sides, but you can't build a bottom. So the, those poisonous waters are going to go into the the nafriatic. How do you say that? The what? The nafriatic. The the to the waters. They're going to they're going to run off into the rivers, and the rivers are going to run the way they do, which is down uh, towards the, the northern sea, and that means they're going to go past lots of Indian villages on the way, and that means that those native people are going to drink poison water and die from it, and that also has been happening in huge numbers. So, you know, it's sort of not funny, what you have to do to keep gas in your car kind of thing. And so we visited the, the cemeteries uh, these, in these, in these uh, indigenous towns up near Fort, Mc, well, Fort McMurray is the big center. And then we took a plane. There's no roads that go up there. We took a small plane up to Fort Chippewyan, which is where the indigenous peoples are. And the, the cemeteries are just full of children's graves. And those are things you can't forget. If you, once you've seen them, you never forget them. And the things that the newspapers don't talk about very much. So then you're, we came back to Calgary, where I was born, and I had a couple of people I wanted to see. We were staying, in, and partly in Fort Chippewa, partly in Calgary, I wrote a, a piece, a, an article. Um, and it was immediately published in Le Monde and Le Devoir, you know, and, uh, and, I, and it's a thing that was reissued in a book called Brut, which means crude, <laughs> crude. Le pétrole brut, c'est crude oil. And so I love the title, it's just crude. And uh, there were three or four other people involved in that book, including Naomi Klein, who's a discussion with the two of us, and so on. And other, other ecological journalists, and so on. That'd be different. So, and I translated it. Anyway, so, that's a book I'm very proud of, but it doesn't, I mean, you've probably never heard of it, but... Uh, oh, now you have. <laughs> no, but I'm sure that that was a good thing for me to write that text. It was a, it was a cri du coeur. It was like... At the heart's cry. Yeah, the heart's cry. I cry from the heart. I cannot bear what is happening here. I cannot bear being part of this uh, world that is doing this. Um, then I wrote this novel, and uh, I was so intent on not trying to point out to the readers where is good and where is evil, and be sure that you get on the good side of this uh, battle and you become real 
tree huggers, you know. I didn't want to do that. So the main character, I decided, I, I sort of, he evolved, he, he happened to me, he came to me little by little, and it was very frightening. He's a very strange young man from Newfoundland, and uh, his name is Varian. And he becomes a serial killer, and he's the positive hero. So that's the, that's the way the book is set up, is that he goes out there to look for his father, who has disappeared in this, in this hell of uh, Fort McMurray, and he gradually, gradually turns into a serial killer. Um, and you'll find, try and figure out why. But I, I wouldn't really be able to say uh, exactly why myself. I just knew that I couldn't, couldn't have good against evil, so I had to somehow find a way of putting, putting evil against evil and making people love a serial killer as compared to this thing that he was, he was traumatized by. Well, this is what literature does. You know, it takes us to extremely uncomfortable places. Yeah. And, and yeah. In a safe sort of manner, makes us think and possibly behave um, differently. So I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn to the audience now um, and ask whether there are any questions at this stage. Um, and if there are any, great. If not, we'll carry on. Yes. <laughs> Uh, why don't you use self-publishing? Because you could Amazon publish Amazon, Amazon publishing. publishing, Amazon publishing. You could publish anything. I hate Amazon. I avoid quite Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Bezos, are you kidding? I'm going to make him more rich than he is. But the idea is worth more than Bezos. Sorry. The idea of the book. Stronger than making rich somebody. <laughs> I'm sort of fatalistic. I think um, I don't think that it's books that change the world anyway. Not novels. I don't think it's books that change the world. Mm, I think I try to. I still will try to write the best books that I can. But I think it's important to also have other forms of political action. So. Being the most widely read author I can isn't my only priority, you know. And uh, and Bezos is for me one of the scariest people on earth. Somebody who mistreats all of his employees, but he wants to send his great grandchildren to another planet because uh, he knows this one's shot. It's really scary. Yeah. Thank you, Nacho. Mm -hmm. A uh, could you reveal to us how your writing routine or writing process looks like and maybe how it developed across, across all these years? Mm, it's a question I really prefer not to answer, but it's not because it's a secret, it's just uh, very, very private. It's like asking people how they make love. <laughs> I, I would rather tell you how I make love. <laughs> you know, if, if there, that's the thing is if, if people make love and, and a child is the result of it, then everybody knows that they made love, right? And otherwise you don't have to know. And it's the same with writing. If, if a book comes out, then you'll know I've been writing. <laughs> but, after party then. Sorry? Maybe in after party then. I after party. <laughs> that's very sweet of you. Uh, but, um, no, it's like it, it seriously is is very it's not something that I feel um, even my manuscripts because I gave my I have to post I have one thing to post about in my life. Now that I've told you the story of what's going on in Western Canada, is that I in nineteen thirteen when I moved uh, in Paris and I and I went through all of my papers and everything, I decided to sell my papers to Canada Archives in Ottawa. And I, and I made a huge list with my uh, assistant, and they wanted my manuscripts. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have manuscripts, because it's too private. It's like giving you my underwear or something like that. I, I can't do it. It's, uh, and I throw them away. But I, can't, I have lots and lots of papers, and, I, and so I, we gave them this huge list of all of my papers, since I'm a very old woman, and I keep everything except my manuscripts. I have lots and lots and lots of 
memories and correspondences and things like that. And so they said, well, yes, we're interested. And they sent two women over to my basement to go through my papers. And, and they took three days making more lists and so on. And then they, they named a price. And I said, I want more than that. And then they said, so I made them go up and up and up. It was Stephen Harper, who was the prime minister at that time, who is oil money, you know? And I wanted to just take as much money as I could away from Stephen Harper. And so <laughs> they finally gave me, I can really tell you, I'm very proud of this. It's the only thing I'm really proud of. They gave me $300,000, and I didn't touch, I didn't put a cent of it on my bank account. I created a fund in uh, Alberta with the Edmonton Community Association uh, with a thing called CEASE, the Committee to End All Sexual Exploitation. And so that means that every year there are uh, two or three indigenous women who can go to school instead of selling their bodies to the, to the oil workers. Wow. It's called the Awinita Fund because there's a character in one of my books called Awinita, an Indian woman in, in Montreal who's a prostitute. So $300,000 went directly from Ottawa to Edmonton and into the pockets of those women who want to study instead of fucking, you know, fucking strangers. <laughs> And I will take control now a little bit because I, I think it's very, very important. You mentioned two words um, that are extremely important and beautiful, I think, and that is um, an old woman um, and uh, indigenous women. So anyway, the word women, and um, that is something, you know, central theme in, in your nonfiction. It's a very important theme in your fiction. And so there are two parts to it, okay? So the theme is women, respect for women, interest in women, interest in women's lives, interest in women's bodies, and how women live their lives in their bodies, and how uh, they live in their bodies, they change, and how different stages of women's lives uh, deserve equal attention. So you started off in the 70s in Paris, uh, you know, as a young feminist, uh, you call yourself GGF, Jolie Jeune Femme, <laughs> young, pretty woman. Uh, now, one of those denominators has changed uh, with time, uh, young, that is. But you still, uh, you were also the editor, one of the editors, you remember the editorial board of two legendary feminist literary journals, Isplat Del, uh, the stories of hers, <laughs> their stories, and witches, their stuff, yeah. So anyway, I was just uh, going to ask you about your um, feminist convictions and how they have evolved over time and why you think it is important or interesting to write about women who are not young anymore. I don't know if I've done a lot of that. But you have, um, you just have read I? a whole chapter. Mm. <laughs> but um, actually, you know what? It's very interesting. Um, I didn't do this on purpose, but ever since I have been in menopause, I've been writing more about men. Really, seriously. And I think there's a connection between the fact that I've been writing much more about men, male characters. The, the dance, the black dance is completely about male characters. Uh, the, all of the heroes are, are men. And the same for the Relative Miracles Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, my most recent book, which you don't know, is, is called Stone Lips. I do know oh, about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, it's about it's part of Cambodia. Let me prove that I know what it is. You know everything about Paul Pot and so on. Yeah. And I think that one of the reasons my more recent books aren't selling well is that my readers, like readers in general of novels, are mostly women, and I think that women are more interested in the theme of women than they are in the theme of men. But the fact is that I've devoted huge amounts of time uh, and joy to thinking and writing about men for the past like 10, 15 years. 
And one thing I did was a performance, a stage performance, called Le Mal Entendu, which could be translated as Mr. Understanding, like a misunderstanding with misters. And it was, I, I have a group of friends that are a jazz trio in Paris. One is a pianist, a, per, a percussionist, and a bass player. Um, and, I, and I love them dearly. They're all younger than I am, but not, they're like little brothers or something to me. Um, and so in 2009, 10, 10, I invited them over, they agreed to embark on this adventure with me, so I would invite them over to my place for dinner, I would get them drunk, and I would ask them questions about their lives as men, in great detail, about what, about their first memories of what, how they would look at little girls, how their, what their hypotheses were about sexual difference, their first feelings, their first masturbation, their experience with prostitutes, their experience as husbands, as boyfriends, as fathers, as sons, and it's uh, and, and I recorded everything they said, and they were very, very generous with their uh, confidences because they knew that they weren't going, nobody was going to be able to identify them on stage. I was going to carry the text myself. So they composed music, we put together the text, uh, you know, sharing we think this should be cut, we should, this should be moved here, and we organized it thematically. And then they, they composed this really fantastic music. I was on stage dressed as a man, but not in any kind of convincing way. I wasn't disguised as a man. I was just sort of, I had a jacket and a hat and maybe a, a tie at the beginning. And I read their words. And it was a, an amazing performance. There were, it must be must have been 25 times. People are often left in tears. It was uh, very much about sexuality, but not only. Some of it was about rape, about rape fantasy, fantasies, and so on. They really didn't censor their what they. Their, they really, I think, told me the truth. And the most incredible performance of this that we did was at the Fleury Mergis prison, which is the largest holding prison in France, 400,000, 4,000 prisoners, male prisoners. It was a smaller one for women. All over the world, as you know, there are 90% men in prison and 10% women. Um, and I go there often. I know people there, and I, I spend a lot of time in prisons, uh, both men's and women's prisons. But this, we did this performance. We, brought the, we got permission to bring in the instruments, and an electric piano, and the drums, and so on. We sort of a smaller version of the, of the concert. And we did it in front of men who had killed, or raped, or both. And the, they were where you are, and the musicians were behind me, and I was the only woman in the room reading these texts in, of men's voices talking about being a man. I think it was the most exhausting afternoon in my life, you know, because there was, there was such an incredible listening and giving that was going through my body, because it was my voice that was carrying these words. And um, so, yeah, I really want to insist, it's not something, it's not, I'm not I'm just saying that to be provocative, that I've also been very interested in men. My most recent book, which I'm sure you don't know, is called Virilité Vrillée, and it came out with a very small publishing house uh, in the south of France. But it's, I think it's very hard to know how to be a man today. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, and, I, I, and I think that our society has, the initially, has sort of given up on any kind of uh, discourse or ritual to, for young boys to help them to become a man. Whereas every society in the history of the human race has considered that a very important thing to do. And so our society says there's no difference between the sexes. All of that is just, you know, made up, added on stuff. It's all uh, ideological and cultural and so on. So, you know, what happens is massive pornography massive recourse to pornography. And that means, again, that there are thousands of young women 
whose lives are being ruined by the fact of being prostitutes in front of cameras for uh, for living uh, for a number of years at a very fragile age. Mm -hmm. So and the and these boys who use the pornography are not going to have happy sex lives either no. later on. So it's really a disaster. But we don't even know what to do about it. We don't even look at it. We don't even talk about it most of the time. At least in, well, in France, we don't. We do a little bit. I mean, uh, human beings are sexual beings and uh, and gender beings, and so we're all in it together. All genders. You know, we just have to work out. And I think. This is what we're trying to do uh, in very, you know, every way that we can, and, and your writing is definitely, definitely part of it. Uh, you know. Why? Well, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> From JJF to thinking about men who rape and how I don't think that they're very happy, as you say, doing that, and uh, you know, thinking about it and dealing with it, and what do we say to, to our young? boys and how to be a man and what do you say about to our young daughters how to be a woman or a girl. I mean that's all you know questions of, of mm. you know big importance. Uh, I, I, I Maybe it's a good time for me to read the other excerpts. I think so too. I think, think so. so too. Yeah. It so might just go ahead. Just yeah. perfectly. I, I, read it I, I agree. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if this is going to be cut in the final version of the novel I'm working on right now, but I wrote it a few months ago, and I thought it might be fun to bring you to hear. Um, it's not autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> Smith College's Paris branch is at Reed Hall a charming late 18th century building in the heart of Montparnasse. Lily Rose falls in love with every detail of the place, the heavy wooden doors at the entrance, the vestibule, the double inner courtyard dotted with trees and shrubs, the narrow crooked hallways and lopsided staircases, the ancient second floor library overlooking a large paneled hall with a grand piano at one end, the classrooms in which small groups of American students convene to listen to teachers hold forth in French on philosophy, history, literature, and a brand new discipline called feminist theory. Lily Rose soon grows addicted to the latter course, taught by a skinny young Canadian with a ferocious blue stare named Mademoiselle Cutie. Pretty much everyone smokes in class. In the course of each two-hour lecture, Mademoiselle Cutie herself smokes three Gaulois filtered cigarettes. One as she takes her notes out of her briefcase and presents the author of the day, one during coffee break, and one at class's end as she gives her students their reading assignments. Lily Rose discovers a series of thrilling new French thinkers, male and female. She takes copious notes struggling to get her mind around complex theories about desires and gazes, often involving untranslatable concepts such as symbolic castration, the speculum, or the cora. The rest of the time, she wanders around the Latin Quarter, her swinging skirts, long-legged gait, curious air, reddish-blonde hair, and open gaze, giving her away as a naive, vulnerable, foreigner. Men of all ages, sizes, and colors find this vulnerability irresistible. They lean toward Lady Rose as she passes them on the sidewalk and mutter dirty words into her ear. Street French being a different language from school book French, she politely asks them to repeat what they said because she didn't quite catch it but always they've moved on by the time she's come up with the correct way to formulate her request. Her first sexual experience in the City of Light is a fiasco. She's in the 6th district, walking down the Rue Monsieur le Prince, when a young man lengthens his stride to catch up with her. Mademoiselle, you are absolutely charming. She smiles her thanks, sizing him up fair-bearded, blue-eyed, not very tall, and liking what she sees. May I buy you a cup of coffee, he asks. Sure thing. I know a nice place at Odeon, Le Danton, just a block or two away. Taken aback, 
The man misses the curb and all but trips over his own feet. That's a bit fancy for me, he says. Oh, I don't mind paying. Why should I always be the man who pays? That's sexist, isn't it? The man gives his uncomfortable assent. They sit down face to face in the brightly lit cafe, a favorite hangout of wannabe writers, publishers, thinkers, and revolutionaries. Noticing that the young man seems ill at ease, Lily Rose tries to bring him out. His name, she learns, is Madine. He's a first year student in medical school and harks from Algeria. Really? She says in surprise. You don't look Algerian. That's because you don't know enough about Algeria, says Nadine, smiling so sweetly that his eyes crinkle at the corners. I'm Berber. Then, not wanting to get bogged down in a lengthy disquisition on North African history and geography, he switches to another topic, namely politics. But, though it ended only a little over a decade ago, Lily Rose has never heard of the Algerian War. Indeed, she is blithely unaware of the fact that France once had colonies in North Africa. Madin is dumbfounded. True? Yeah, sorry. Tell me about it. Madin realizes that if he wants to perform in bed later on, he should probably avoid dredging up memories of French soldiers inflicting water torture on his father and completely non-symbolic castration on one of his uncles. He contents himself with smiling at Lily Rose and recommending that she see the Ponte Corvo film, The Battle of Algiers. She's never heard of that either. Nor, Madine discovers, is she aware of the existence of Franz Fanon or Jean-Luc Godard or Katia Yassine or Chris Marker Stymied by her ignorance, he has no idea where to go from there. He casts about for a topic of conversation. What are you studying? he asks. Feminist theory, answers Lily Rose. This draws a blank in his brain. What's that? he says, floundering. In turn, Lily Rose recites a long list of names that mean nothing to Madine. Sixou, Irigaray. Christeva, Vitig, his beautiful blue eyes go darting around your danton, seeking some pretext to get up and ditch this impossible broad. Would you like some chocolate cake, she asks him. And the word yes escapes him before he has time to think. He skipped lunch and is starving. Moreover, he has a weakness for chocolate. On the other hand, if he lets her pay for this in addition to the coffee, how will he ever get rid of her afterwards? Alas, she already knows he rents a room right next to where their paths first crossed, in the modest, not to say, cruddy Hotel Stella. Lily Rose is increasingly attracted to Madin. His gentle manners, reddish blonde beard, crinkly blue eyes, and passionate politics are a welcome change from the verbose, insistent American professors and students she's been dealing with these past few years. Men who, after flaunting and vaunting their wealth and academic credentials, suddenly fall silent, change personalities, and bear down on her with their bodies until they are spent, then lie there gasping on her chest as she collects her ideas for her term paper on water images in the novels and correspondence of Virginia Woolf. Cornered, Madine finally invites Lily Rose up to his room, where, amidst the hopeless clutter of medical textbooks, research papers, unemptied ashtrays, and unwashed socks, he entertains and seduces her to the best of his abilities. Never before has he met a woman like Miss Darrington, one who is willing to copulate with a stranger for the fun of it, with no promise of a second meeting, no declaration of respect, no clean bill of health, no strings attached, no guilt, no love, no nothing in fact. And so, well, nothing. Thank you.
we're going to have to stop. May I ask one more question? One more question. Do you have audio books of yourself? Um, there are some in English. I don't have any in French. A few exist in English. Of uh, fault lines and infrared. Um, maybe Dolce Agonia. They said they were made in England and in Australia, but not in Canada or the States, as far as I know. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. And thanks for